My carpenters are called grad students. <laughs> yeah. We used to have a carpentry shop, but that's gone away. So we have to be even more inventive. But you know, undergrad students and grad students are smart people. And you know, my also my lab specialist, she's great. You know, she's trying to really save money wherever she can because you know she's going to be employed much longer if she makes things really on a cheap way. So she's gotten really good at you know coming up with inventive, innovative things. Um, okay, so one thing we obviously haven't spoken about, oh, okay, we haven't spoken or they didn't speak about is how to then actually capture the data, like how first to get that composite image of, you know, 50 vials or so to be separated into individual images. And I will show some ways of doing that tomorrow because, again, there's pre and pretty simple to use software out there to actually partition images. Um, and then, um, we, you guys have heard that before, that the initial idea for the, the data capture from these labels was then to do OCR, but it seems that OCR for tiny little labels like that is still too big of a challenge, so they were going to be going for the volunteer crowdsourcing approach. Okay, with that to the, um, are there any questions? No. <laughs> I wanted you to take us through the um, collection labels and uh, determination labels, identification labels, and barcode labels, and uh, demonstrate how all these should be incorporated in such a small vial. And uh, <laughs> where, where should we put which one? Yeah. Or so which one do we give priority? In the vials, actually, in a, in a, in a fluid preserved specimen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually very difficult. And the difference and between all those. Right. Papers. So he sort of glossed, they glossed over that a little bit. So they said for the purposes of their data capture project, the labels they were most interested in are really the locality label that would have, you know, the entire string of locality information, the collector, the collection date, maybe the collecting methods, if you can fit it on the same label. And then in some cases, a, a, a code for the field trip or something like that. So that information, in many cases, at least that's how we insect people do it. I'm not quite sure about you, you know, arachnid people. It might be a little different. So we typically put all that information on one label. So that will become the you know, label of primary interest, I guess. And in their case, they said, okay, make sure that this label is actually facing into the correct direction when we're doing the scan of the whole thing. He showed one example. There was a bunch of other labels floating in that, in that vial. And he said, well, when we turn around the, um, um, the vial rack and, and, and we image it from the other side, we maybe will be able to capture some of that information. So try to make sure to you know, orient it such that you will get some of the information. But I have to admit also from personal experience, the, um, the uh, vials we're using are smaller than those. We use these tiny little plastic vials and they're not perfectly clear. So imaging through them is not really a possibility. And then also you can't really turn the labels in those very easily. So really what we typically do when we, um, um, when we put specimens into these vials, we make sure the locality label goes on one side and then the USI label, the specimen, the barcode label goes in the other side and then everything else is in between. But obviously that means if you're interested in actually finding out what tax on it is for actual databasing, we will have to do what they were talking about, they're trying to avoid. And for size of that project, that's the 60 million specimens in you know, four years project, they have to avoid. But for a lot of our research project, we still will have to do that. So we take out uh, the specimens. And we're, again, we're not quite as concerned maybe about damage. So I would just take out all the labels, organize them, and take an image of the specimen, take an image of the labels, essentially. And then you're saying the different types of labels and how we organize them in the image. Um, I guess one important thing is, and this applies more to pin specimens really, is you never want to alter the order in which labels are pinned on a specimen. 
So let's say you have five labels on a thing, you start taking them off from the bottom. You put like the bottom one down on the bottom of your tray or wherever you're taking the image and you take the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And then you take your image, you image your labels, and then on the way back you go the reverse order. So you put one, you know, the one that's now on top, like all the way back on top, and you make sure you all get them, keep them in order, essentially. Just because it's not, you know, A, you want to be able to see the locality label as the topmost um, label in every case on a pin specimen, just because this is the core information everyone's interested in. Then a host, um, if there's separate host um, species label, that would be second. And then the identification labels would go below. And it is important to keep especially these identification labels in order because the researchers visiting a collection, if they're really good people, they will have the little pre-printed labels with their name on it, say determination, this and that person. And that label will also have a year at least. So you can see from the label actually when that specimen was identified to a certain um, taxon. But a lot of the older labels, or when people are in a rush, they forgot there are actually default labels, they might not put a date on it. So essentially by the order in which they're stacked on the pin, you will know which determination is the oldest, a little bit younger, even younger, and then the one on the bottom, in many cases, will be the most recent identification that I'm not saying in all cases, but very frequently would be the most up-to-date taxonomy and the most accurately identified um, of these labels. It's, you know, it's all part of the collection assessment, really, where you, you, know, you have to look at your collections and see what you, what you have, really, and what you're working with, essentially. Okay. Cool, and then um, let's just do another round of, um, of video when we're talking about slide mounted insect specimens because again, I'm learning how to do that. <laughs> I'm very much at the beginning uh, and I very much enjoyed actually finding these videos and realizing that if you have access to the internet, there's so much information and all these you know, curation methods and things like that out there, it's really amazing. Okay, so microscopic slide, a little bit easier. We're dealing with two dimensional specimens, obviously, but again, the challenges that are so small. Again, you want to keep the purpose in mind for a lot of the scanning, and this is what you're going to be seeing in that video. The purpose is really the label data, very much similar to the fluid preservation um, video I showed before, just because, again, we're dealing with 60 million specimens for that particular project. So taking out specimen or um, putting the microscopic slides under an actual compound microscope and getting high resolution images of the specimens, that's not the goal and the purpose of this particular project. Okay, purpose will determine how data will be captured. Again, you have the scanner options or you have the high resolution imaging systems. Um, and then, um, and this is actually true for both the fluid preservation and this one, the file naming can be semi-automated in some ways. And again, this is something we're gonna be talking about tomorrow. Okay, without further ado, I let the, the young man talk again.